kind of uh, recap just a little bit and start recap. back in. I know it's, it's spontaneous and it's uh, in the it moment is. sometimes. I just crap myself. Okay, so today we're going to talk about <laughs> shame. What I'm shame. We're going to talk about shame today. So uh, yeah. let's let's talk about that. All right, good to have you in the studio, Dan. Oh, we're uh, starting from scratch. Yeah, we're starting from scratch. I like this. Uh, I, I like to this. say it, but now that you made me say that again. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Guy Therapy and Dan Rose. So, mm -hmm. Dan, tell me about uh, what's been going on with you lately. Well, it um, I'm, I'm getting a bit of deja vu here, but you know what? We're not talking about deja vu. No, we're talking about which, by the way, deja vu is is a um, from a psychological perspective. It, it there, there there are certain uh, defensive and um, return of the repressed elements that we won't get into, but at some point we will. Uh, we're talking about okay. shame. We're talking okay. about its uh, what it is, its role, how um, it may be chronic and insidious shame may be behind a lot of behaviors that it's hard for us to uh, that we may not initially be able to point to shame but it's there lurking in the background i mean it almost sounds like we had this from birth i mean shame is part of the culture part of what we do uh, in uh, raising children and do some other kind uh, of and that you sort of well. again sort of right. semi deja vu um i was the the example the mom in uh, i was in panera and uh Panera Bread. Can we get a uh, any chance of sponsorship from the Panera Breads? Uh, like that's um, I would love one. They have these things called uh, pecan braids. So I'm pecan all about braids. that. Yeah, but don't, a, I don't want to. Well, I was I was we'll with talk to uh, them later. I, I was with uh, um, uh, one of my colleagues, and she called the the he called them. Hey, they have claw bears. Yes. And what she meant was bear claw, but I thought to myself, it sounds French. Claw bear. I'm gonna have a claw bear. Right. Claw bear. But uh, um, she had one way. You're never going to get an order talking like that. <laughs> Club air. But, I'll but just uh, so we're, we're we're at Panera. And no, we're, we're going to talk about shame a little bit. And so something happened there. All right. I, so so there's a woman sitting next to me, and um, she turns to her child, an infant, and says, "Oh, I think the boy's diaper needs to be changed." You know. Okay. And at this point in this child's development, the, the it right. is a natural process. She simply changed the diapers. But if he had been five or six years old, that something right. else would have happened. Not much of a problem at that age, right? But and what five, may have happened yes. is, and so shame is one of the things that ushers us, that um, helps get us um, uh, uh, insinuated into society. So moderate shaming is one another example. You pull the cat's tail, and, and mom or dad says, "Nope, you don't do that. No, we don't pull cat's tails around here." Right. At that moment, there is there is um, shame is an, an affect that is central to the potential for the sort of accommodation you need to make to be able to learn. And moderate shaming then followed by usually um, containment or modulation by an adult figure if the uh, oh, that's interesting. There, there's almost um, there's two step process. There, yes, it's a two step. There's a follow up mm -hmm. afterwards that makes sense. I, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever uh, well, thought of it in that way. So think about with that second step, there is a containment of the process, and so you you are for a moment brought down, and then you come back up into some sort of homey. You know, if, if the child gets really upset, then you might say, "There, there, there. Look, it's okay. Well, I just don't want you to pull the cat's tail. The cat will hurt if you do that. I know you love the cat." So there is. There is the pulling of the tail, the response that generates some shame, and then there is another response. That is sort of the moderate shaming that comes from sort of um, healthy socialization. But lots of folks don't have, they either have uh, too much of one or the other, and as a result, it doesn't necessarily become an affect they can make use of. Right. And um, an example, um, I was thinking of an example where I experienced some shame. I was at my uh, nephew's graduation. Um, he graduated from prison. He's just, uh, he just uh, served his 10 years. I don't know if you, where you were going <laughs> No, no, that, but, he graduated uh, from CSU. Can okay. we get an, can, can CSU sponsor this? Because we got Panero, Panera, CSU. Uh, doubtful. That's not going to Doubtful. Um, I kind of know some of those folks. No. That's Sorry, no that's not going to happen. happen. Okay. Right. So, so, uh, but I, uh, um, there was a moment and I was sort of, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to one of these CSU graduations, but they last 12 hours. Yes, I have, and, and yes, they do. And at some point, I was a little distracted and bored, so I was on my phone. Okay. And they they would ask you to stand up for certain things, and they ask, if you were in the military, please stand up while we, um, while we you know, we, we honor you. And right. I stood up because... I was just paying attention, Wait, and when I stood, stood up, when they <laughs> and asked so, for the, okay. so suddenly they're like this, and my wife says, what are you doing? And then I realize what's happened, and I feel shame, and then I sit down, right? Right. 
Now, yeah, how quickly you sat down. I would love to have the video I going down, on that, but you know, still, all right. But for first, well, actually, I to, to throw him off, I started talking about my time in Nam. I said <laughs> how I, you know, how I had to. In Charlie fact, and all I lived guys. off. I lived off human ears for like three weeks. That was like, you know, it's just a. Uh, you know, you, this, you, this is the story we do not need to follow. <laughs> no, if we don't, we'll I'm just, just saying. Let that go right you now. can chew oh, on an ear st- for a week. <laughs> okay, yeah, but you stood up during the time. You know, it was embarrassing. In that. Embarrassing. Right. So that moment of shame was a corrective. Now, here's the thing. You probably wouldn't think this, but I've had a relatively healthy development. <laughs> it's probably not. Uh, <laughs> okay, there's no way to document that at this really point isn't. in time. It's too late. Right. But the but the behavioral observations. <laughs> there are, there are lots of data that would contraindicate this. I realize yes, exactly. But as I but as I so I was able to sit down. So for a brief moment, and I like this. We talked about this last time. I like this notion of the euthymic window. Yes, that's just a fancy term for saying that most our nervous system tries to keep things on a kind of smooth balance, and that there is this window where it can go up and still be okay, and down and be okay. And we talked about before that if uh, if you're watching a scary movie, it goes up, but it's a scary movie, so you get just scared enough. And then you, yeah. you laugh and you go back down. If you're watching a sad movie, boom, it goes down. So you're watching like, you know, ever seen this old yellers? Ever seen the old yeller? Oh, yes. I don't want to give away the ending, yes. but they shoot the kid. Oh, the kid. Wait, <laughs> no, wait. What? No, no, no. no. That's, hey. that, there's nothing. No, that's not right <laughs> nothing, at I all. Just, I don't, I don't, see, I don't, you saw a different movie. <laughs> I did. I did. I, that's, maybe. I, but no, they, they shoot the dog. And so whew, for a brief moment, you feel horrible, right? But it's a controlled thing. Shame operates it it generates a parasympathetic response so it's like suddenly taps the brake on and you go from here to here Foom. so when i stood up i went right. but i was unable to regulate i was able to laugh and say darn i was able to talk to myself in a way and self-soothe myself and say you know what that i didn't mean that i wasn't mean to be disrespectful it wasn't you know um, all that sort of stuff. Right. And I was able to find a balance. Some some people might make mm-hmm. a uh, an interpretation with it, um, and you know, scribe all kinds of they meaning can, yeah. to it when really you were on your phone distracted. You heard well, something. It, I meant nothing by it, right. but you're right. Someone could say to themselves that once again I've screwed up. I always screw up. I should never leave the house. You could right. feel all sorts. You could do the opposite response. You could say, "Wow, well, screw military folks anyway." You know, ah, you could do all sorts. There, there yeah, are ways to you answer could go that. Either way. Um, either way. In fact, in the second one I mentioned is a form of that people often don't think about this, but what usually fuels rage, particularly in dudes and in people who have a narcissistic organization, is shame. So when they become dysregulated, they briefly move, just almost, almost. It's it's like a nanosecond. They move down. And then they overcompensate, and they overcompensate through rage because this feeling of helplessness, moving down too much, it, it feels, you feel helpless. You, uh, it is, um, Coat talks about it, is, or Shore talks about it like this too. Shame can generate what's known as an implosion of the self. And think mm. about this notion That's of implosion. Serious. When you were in a shame state, you can feel as if you were completely and utterly bad. The whole world is looking at you, and you are horrible, mm-hmm. and you wanna you wanna just collapse into this single black point, right? Right. It's an implosion, and to avoid that, all sorts of things happen. And but if you have a decent developmental history, if you have uh, a combination of nature and nurture at your disposal then you can you can self soothe and you can modulate right and so you can come back right and we talked about this before about how we might want to think a little bit about the difference between modulation and regulation right mm-hmm. and the difference is is that modulation is usually a bit more sophisticated i talked to myself i said you know what i didn't mean any harm this is not about but regulation could be what if right as soon as it happened i grabbed myself and i just gave myself a huge pinch mm-hmm. right and that's a form of um, of excoriation. It's a form of self harm. It's a way of 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 punishing myself and grounding myself in this instantaneous way. So I stop the process, but it's not necessarily a healthy alternative, right? So we want to think about if you don't have that developmental history, therapy can give you this the possibility mm-hmm. of being able to come up with ways to modulate. Maybe you begin with regulation. And when we think about this and when we're working with patients, we often give them regulatory 
um, homework or uh, uh, tips. Look, it's been a bad day. Go sit in the hot tub. Um, it's been rough. Why don't you go watch a movie? Nothing wrong with those, but they are mm. regulatory. To modulate requires some owning awareness and integration. You have to have a dance with your mo emotion. So it requires a combination of mindfulness of your own states and then a mentalization of yourself and the world in such a way that you could do something with it. Right. Does that make sense? No, it absolutely <clears throat> makes sense. And if you if you can't find those things, if you're not in therapy, you have yeah. a therapist who's helping you out with yeah. some of those ideas, um, you may be left up to your own uh, ideas yourself. And, and that's where that regulation, that, and that's where that, that regulatory function, or complete dissolution. You know, we folks yeah. with folks who struggle with personality disorders, folks who in the, who uh, borderline personality for, disorder, for instance. They can experience that implosion to such a degree that that they want to die, or that they that they hurt themselves, or they they simply fall to pieces, right? So there is this. Whew. But what I think makes shame so insidious is is that, um, and since I've been thinking about this concept, I've been sort of listening for it happens with me. Okay. And um, um, it um, I can think of um, numerous occasions if I'm in a staff meeting or if I'm um, if I'm in a, a meeting or something, and I'm in a room full of people. I'm aware that I am susceptible sh to shame in all sorts of ways. Like if somebody begins to talk and I hear that they're articulate in what, they, what they're saying and I, want to, I say to myself, wow, man, they really talk good. I don't talk good. Ugh. And then suddenly I can feel the potential for some shame. Right. And if I'm not careful, I will regulate by starting to doodle or check out of the meeting. Okay. Um, I could um, dysregulate. Actually, right. this is more some a form movie. of regulation is I could right. say, ah, they're idiots. They don't know anything, right? They're suddenly then that's a narcissistic way to be able to um to to diminish them as a way to create some sort of equilibrium myself. Sounds like there's so many different ways <clears throat> to <throat> respond in that, then <throat> some are much better <clears throat> than others. <throat> but if you go down the narcissistic route, maybe the others we start to blame other people or point well, fingers and out. And that's the outward. essence of sort of that narcissism. But remember that if there are three ways to do this, this if there is um if there is um uh, dysregulation, where I simply fall apart, and I'm I, I stew. If there is regulation, both positive and negative, doodling is positive in a way, but it keeps me out of the meeting. Um, uh, narcissistic projection um, that generates a different, maybe negative, but a third will be modulation, and that's to be able to notice the feeling that I'm having, to generate some curiosity about it, and that's where that self-reflective mindfulness kind of sort of comes in. What is this thing I feel? Why do I feel it? Once I give that a name, then I can do something with it. And then I can say, ah, there I go again. You know, sometimes I can really feel bad in ways that may have nothing to do with the, with the world I'm in. And then I might be able to lean first into myself, right. give myself credit, be kind to myself. Okay, this is part of what I struggle with, who I am. And then I can lean into them and say, you know what, they're okay. They really did their homework. I can tell they prepared for this meeting, maybe in ways that I didn't, and I sure am glad they did. Mm -hmm. Those, so there are three potential, you know, and I think I said this last time, we can think of there are three yeses that make the third at least possible. Um, with the simple implosion, none of those yeses happen. With the regulation, at least one or two. And the first yes is you have to be able to um, become aware Right. You have to acknowledge. And the second yes is to say yes and to be able to own it. Yes, this is me. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is happening to me. Yes, this is me. And the second is, yes, I can learn from this. And that's where the modulation comes in. It allows you to sort of think about it in a way that there could be wisdom. And as we talked about this last time, too, that if mm -hmm. part of our job, not as just as therapists, but also as human beings... We have, there is no way to get rid of suffering, but we can find a way to get better at suffering. And in those moments of suffering, there is the potential wisdom. There's, a, there's something that could arrive in a way that could grow us and the world that we're in, and that'd be cool if we could do it. So. Yeah. Um, I, I feel I, really bad because I talked a lot and I didn't say anything stupid. So I've got a lot of stupid things built up. I'm just going to tell well, you. Well, let's just uh, let's don't let's don't go down that road of shame. Let's uh, <laughs> okay. practice some modulation there, if that's you will. Right. Um, I'm fine with that, as a matter of fact. So I think you said a lot of good things there. It it does seem like, and you miss, mentioned complexity. It does seem like this is a complex psychological transaction that mm -hmm. you have you're having inside. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Are we? 
do many people have that, or maybe mm. this is part of a bigger issue? You have to be uh, an obsessive bastard like me. That's really where it comes <laughs> in. It's, it's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going with that. Um, so, it, um, yeah, so I, I, it's almost as if we have to prepare ourselves for dealing with shame. We know these things happen. But you have talked many times on this on this, uh, show and uh, about the idea, the, the, the need to really take the breath, to lean in, to think about things, to be, mm. become self-aware. To become curious, and, in a way. Well, yeah, it, it mm. is something like that. And I just, um, I mean, we all need to get trained up on this. Well, you know, I... It's I, not an easy, reactive I got a mortgage thing. to pay, so I'd love for everybody to want to get really into this sort of thing, because it would, uh, you know, I could, I could pay off that mortgage. There's uh, some... Okay, so you're looking for a profit in this. <laughs> I uh, am. I understand Some that, plastic yeah. surgery I want to do. I want to get those butt implants. And, <laughs> oh, please. You know, no, not that. Uh, not that. Not that. I was only able to afford one. That's why I'm sitting funny. Cause All right, right you're now. sitting at an angle. All right, wait. Let me ask another question. Uh-huh. I mean, this idea of shame, you've been sort of centered on the self with this. But people you shame on others. Mm. I, you talked about the parent doing that, but mm. then sort of pulling back a little bit mm. and uh, having the second part of that where you can contain it a little bit. But it seems like shame is being used as a weapon almost in in our mm. society at different times. Yeah, and, and if we can think about that, you know, there is a way in which all these emotions have a place. And shame may be the most difficult to find any sort of thing useful with it, but it has a place. But I think it becomes weaponized when um, when the person doing the shaming is in a narcissistically vulnerable state, and so they shame. And we as parents can do that. Like, um, uh, you know, as a psychologist, I'm obviously a perfect parent, and don't ever do this. That was a horrible joke because the first uh, thing. That as soon as you <laughs> mentioned that, it was. Uh, we funny. all, I think, most people hearing this would. Well, it's fascinating that. because I I had a child later in life. Um, I was 72. And kidding, I was, I was, uh, that was my IQ at the time. Oh, I, uh, I, uh, you, you beat me to that joke, but it was, I was, was uh, I couldn't quite get there in head. So head. I was forty when I had a kid. Okay. And so I had been, I'd work with adolescents especially, but I would work with some kids, and I would do family therapy now and again. And we're we're taught in textbooks all this thing about how to how to be a parent, and sure. we often have this uh, this image. Of, I see this often when I'm when I'm training younger uh, younger therapists that you know. Parents shouldn't do that, you know, and and they often, they'll often side with patients in terms of sort of vilifying parents. Not that sometimes parents don't, but when I had a child, it became so apparent to me how difficult this was, and that there is no way to do this perfect, and the best you can hope for is okay and good. And I say this because children are a challenge, and they they touch our buttons, and they they they. They take us out of that euthymic window in so many ways. And um, I can think of sometimes when I'm in a place where I'm angry at my son or I want to shame him, if I can slow myself down, just like I would be in one of those meetings, if it's possible to be right now there is something my son is doing or saying that is making me want to really just jump down his throat, what is it? If I can catch it, then I don't necessarily weaponize shame. That can be sometimes tough to do. Sometimes it has to be retroactive. You know? Like, I remember um, my son really likes video games. Okay. And I remember he saying to me, well, he was proud, I'm a gamer, he says. Oh. Now, he feels pride in that, but, you know, video games make me nervous. And I was hoping he would say that he's really into postmodern poetry. <laughs> and he didn't say that. <laughs> no, he was that's not. A, that's a that's a long shot, maybe yeah. these days. But yes, he I wasn't going to suddenly tell me how much he likes John Ashbery. If he said that, I'd be like, you know, man, you're my dude. You're... <laughs> but he said that, so my first response was to denigrate. I could really feel myself, and then I stopped and things. But you know, my son is growing a dad, just like I'm growing a son, and he has given me something that I need to find a way to accommodate. I've never been the dad of a twelve year old, and he's never been a twelve year old. Uh, so. We're working on this together, and so once again, if you're able to be able to take note of this, to be curious of the emotion that you have, at least if not in that moment, later, and then you can lean first into yourself, and the image is like if when you're on an airplane and the thing comes down, you're supposed to take a breath first, 
And then you lean into him. And then I'm able to meet him where he's at and to say something like, I really, really love the fact that you can tell me the things that you love. This is how you make a good life, to find the things that you love and to pursue them. And that is wonderful. Don't ever lose that, son. And that is a different route to go then than, you know, um, throwing his computer out the window and making him wear a football helmet for, uh, you know, the next three months. That's not what you do. <laughs> or at least make him, uh, <laughs> make him read John Ashbery. I was going to quote some Ashbury, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. But in a second, I will. Don't worry. A little but, bit of like a like a blip there. Then something happened. There, there was a blip. And um, do you know what it was? It was. Um, I think it was a quantum singularity. That um, for a brief minute, everything ceased to exist. Um, is that Ray Kurzweil? Is that we? Are we at the singularity? I thought we had a ways to go before. We I got don't know. To it's that that's, I got to. Uh, all right, but um, I'm right, told so anytime I'm naked, that's when it's there. That's that's um, really singular. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we don't have to see any of that too. All Actually, right, I got so pictures. we're talking about shame. And shame. I, we, Speaking we're, of we're, nudity we're, and shame, go really good. They're really highly connected. I want to try to get this conversation going back to where we are, mm -hmm. and we could use we could go in there. Could, I'm not sure. Well, where were we at? Where, 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 where were we at? Where, what was going on? All right. So this idea of other shame, mm -hmm. you're being used in culture and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I think was is is mm -hmm. where we're talking about. So, uh, but but you were talking about this modulation mm -hmm. of shame, being able to sort of maintain it, first being aware of it, and then kind of coming those to three yeses, some kind of way. that awareness, um, that that. Um, um, that's not a. It's awareness, a an owning, and then being able to learn from it. And maybe the way to think about this is that you know that um, shame is one of those emotions that we're really pushed away from. We, um, it's not something people want to lean into. It's not some people want to think about. Like, we take the example I gave of standing up at um, the graduation when they were honoring the veterans. You know. There's even something to learn there to be able to say, well, why was I on my phone? Is there something about the way that I handle my stress that may keep me out of situations? If I had been more awake and alive, there may have been things that I could have experienced that I missed because I, was, I was, wasn't there. Right. And the shame may allow me to think about that. All of our emotions are supposed to give us a snapshot into the world that we're in and the world that we could build. They they tell us things about the now and also the future. What we could what we could what we could be accomplishing, where we could move. And so what I might say to folks who maybe, you know, whoever might be listening to this, mm -hmm. most of those are gonna be folks in prison. Death row I think is the number one uh but, uh, that's how demographic is. I think it's death row. So, um, death row. Um, hope you guys are doing well. Okay. It is. That's right. Yeah, shout out. To uh, the, all I got to say is make sure that you you do spell check before you uh, do your your homemade tattoos because that can be embarrassing. I'm yes, telling you. Yes. Uh, not, great uh, commercial. No regrets. Okay. Yeah. If, if you uh, if you if you put Santa instead of Satan, it really <laughs> sends a different message. I'm just saying. It's just uh, not yeah. as tough. But the <laughs> walk away, good. I think, from this, something sort yeah. of a takeaway to think about this is, is, um, is like all of our emotions, shame can be something we can listen to. And if we can, we can grow from it. And what makes shame insidious and chronic is it's one of those feelings that we often don't look into. It's usually masked by something else. Sadness, that's one. But more yeah. often, I think, anger. And right. I think we are often moving again. Think about that euthymic window. If you can imagine just right. that, we briefly get pulled here, and it's much better to be an explosion than an implosion. It's much better to be able to, to affect the world than to be broadly affected by it. And so we move boom, to here. And the goal, I think, to think about is um, how can we listen to this and try to own it. And one of the ways to do this is, you, it would be, you know, we were sort of joking earlier about therapy, and again, I still got that mortgage, but right. you could just practice being aware. You could just try to give yourself a moment or two to practice being a, aware and connected with the, with the things that move through you, the feelings you have. That's the beginning of, of opening up that first yes. 
Right. And you can practice that. You can you can sit with the things that you feel. You can just listen for what moves inside of you. That's the first step, and uh, that's something maybe you just want to think about. Yeah, I, I know we talked a lot about these kinds of issues where people have to <clears throat> really begin to <clears throat> reflect on their their own experiences and and be in touch with that not be afraid of it and, I, and i'm thinking that that's kind of the crux of the matter is really to be able to be able to sort of step back from what happened and what you're feeling in them and 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 i'm not sure uh, i mean if we could bottle that and sell it uh, i'm not sure everybody's doing that because uh, the response to shame may be this narcissistic or maybe anger as you mm -hmm. talked about a moment ago um so i'm kind of curious about um that it's almost like that's the first step that has mm -hmm. to happen before anything else happens and that's where the practicing begins what often happens if you're in a therapy setting you're in a safe situation where you can spew and you can simply feel and the person sitting across from you might be able to help you to start name it and in the naming it you become aware um, there's another f saying by one of my favorite cats Wilfred Beyond it takes two people to think a dangerous thought shame is such a dangerous thought often being in the presence of other someone else and this is something that you internalize so when you have the capacity for regulation or modulation when you have the uh, capacity for at least those first two yeses it's because you had someone in your life who did that second step we talked about you weren't just shamed but someone who also helped to hold you afterwards so you could do something with it right. the therapist becomes that it's sort of a corrective emotional experience you begin to have it's a, a little bit in a way of form of reparenting and then you begin to internalize that and you can do that a little for yourself if you begin to practice too how to be able to listen to those moments when you can feel it arise in you right and uh, this idea of shame almost so sounds like it's a, a hurtful emotion mm. a hurtful event it hurts you at a mm. at a deep level and it can trigger other things i mean if you're a little on the depressed side it can mm. make you yep. probably more depressed right that's that sadness of, piece right yeah mm. um this is an interesting topic though um <clears throat> i'm not sure that that people talk a lot we try to avoid shame Mm -hmm. Not, I don't want to be shamed, or yeah. I'm put a put up a big defense. It's nobody's those favorite those dwarf. People like Dopey, they like Doc, but they don't like shame. Is that one of them? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, that didn't sound. Like I don't know. Another person thing there's for a second, but uh, Dopey, there's do Dopey, <laughs> Doc, Moist. I can't think of some of the other names. You know. Yeah. Uh, incontinent. All right, I got one joke for you about that. Yeah. Well, all right. So the or the dinosaurs. Um, the, they're uh, the the uh, the reindeers they they hate the most. The name of the reindeer that the dinosaurs hate the most. Well, what, what is the name of the reindeer that dinosaurs hate the most? I don't know. What what would that be? Comet. Comet. You got. <laughs> I I thought about that. I was right, like, yeah. gave you a, Which, by the way, a, if you're into music, yeah. the band Wire have a great song called Comet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, we need to do a music show Let's with do you. It. That's a problem, though. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> you're obscure. Uh, I was telling you, on the way in here, I was so feeling much. the weight of my week. I was feeling wearied. It wasn't shame I was feeling. I was feeling exhaustion. Right, I was feeling right. spent. And then someone mentioned that there's a new John Luther Adams um, composition that they have a recording of, a Become Desert. And suddenly I felt myself more alive. Hey, when there's I, something new. I am going to find that there. thing there when I are. get home, and I'm going to listen to that sucker. And then yeah. my wife's going to kick me out of the house. Yeah, and she's gonna say, "Take your records and get the heck out of yeah. here." All right. So, uh, well, that's 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 kind of fun. All right. So we we did this um, this last time we met, mm -hmm. um, and we talked a little bit about uh, self help, and there's a lot of other things we're going to do uh, through the studio mm -hmm. here. Dating, about, about dating, yeah. dating tips. No, it's not a dating app at all. Here's the thing. Um, what what advice uh, can you sort of encapsulate here for? for people around this shame. I mean, first, shaming others is not probably a very productive way to go about changing another behavior, but what can you do about your own shame? So, self-help minute, what would you say? Well, again, this no, the, the capacity to be able to, to insert a pause between the reflexive behavior you engage in. So if you can have a, if you can think before you act and feel before you act, that's really important. That's the beginning of a yes. To develop a curiosity for the things that move inside you, including things that don't feel so good like shame. And I know that takes practice. 
But the first step is to be curious. What is this that moves in me? There's a theorist by the name of Jean Jacques Lacan, not Jacques Lacan, very different person, no. uh, who uh, um, talks about that there is an extimate core inside us. And think about that. It's a fancy, really word word that there is opposed to something intimate. It's something inside of us that feels like it's not us. So it's extimate. And shame is one of those extimate, not me states. And so there are many things about us that are us that we haven't had a chance to dance with. We haven't had a chance to be able to bring them up and give them a seat at the table. So the beginning of this, if you can, is really curiosity. So what I'm going to ask is, it's very easy to to feel, when we feel shame, we want to disown something we're experiencing. We want to remove ourselves from the situation. And And I know this is not something that can happen overnight. But if you can begin to develop the curiosity and to be to be to to listen for and that requires um being kind to yourself in lots of ways allowing yourself to be foolish and an idiot these are all steps in this process but again i go back to curiosity how can you begin to to just listen and think about yourself in some ways that maybe you don't often allow yourself to feel and think yeah oh well that's 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 good advice this idea of uh, sort of being a little bit more aware of things and not being swept away mm. by um, by your emotion. I mean, you, we've mm. talked about this a, a, mm. as well, is you don't really have control of those emotions that mm-hmm. pop up. Mm. And we sen- tend sometimes to sort of stay in that state, mm. uh, whatever. If it's a negative emotional mm. state, we mm. may stay there. And you think like, uh, like oftentimes, like I can think of things that may be shame triggers for me. And anybody who begins to make fun of my tiny Tim memorabilia. Yes. And I think, you know... Um, um, I, I, I apologize for bringing <laughs> that up almost every time we that's meet. Right, so, um, but it's not, uh, it's not a big deal. That's also something to think about. All of us have specific triggers. There are moments where we have been shamed in the past. There are moments where we have... We, um, uh, nobody gets through... Um, um, comes out of the womb and stays on the planet for very long before they have a, a few wounds from the shame that they've had. And that may be a question to ask yourself too. What what are the triggers? What what are the things that often bring you shame? What is it that that about who you are or where you are or where you've been or where you're going that might that might make you ashamed? Well, now final question: mm-hmm. Is there anything positive about shame? Mm-hmm. Well, is there a positive <clears throat> aspect of shaming? I mean, the, it, it certainly parents use this all the time. Moderate shaming kids, is part you know? of socialization and whatnot. I think like any emotion, the most positive thing about it is, and I've said this before, we have no control over what we feel, and it's supposed to be that way. If we had control over what we feel, we would choose happiness, and we would have all been eaten by bears long ago. <laughs> they, would have, we, they would have found us easy pickings. We would have been sitting in a corner, rocking back and forth, smiling, and they would have just gobbled us up. Right, right. <laughs> so the positive thing about it is our emotions are important. Give yourself uh, both credit and cut yourself enough slack to be able to be okay with, if it, to some degree, with what you feel. So the takeaway is shame is positive, just like all emotions are positive. The act of shaming someone may not be because that may be a moment when you're not being curious. You are discharging and projecting. You are taking something you feel and you're trying to place it in someone else. But the shame that you feel and the emotions you feel, they are positive because they point you toward who you really are and where you and may help you go where you may want to go. All right. I like it a lot. All right. Uh, we've learned a lot about shame today. Yeah. We had, uh, uh, there's no shame in Doing, no, or Tiny about. Tim. Nothing about Tiny Tim that should, you should be shamed of. His uh, version of Tiptoe to the Tulips. I don't know if you've... Uh, do you have that album? The first of all, Albums. I, I got albums. That I've got albums. more Tiny Tim bootlegs <laughs> than you, that guy. Bootleg. That guy oh, man. Is, this, is, uh, this is too much. All right. So we talked about shame today. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, a lot of decisions for you to make about taking a quick vacation or going to a concert. I could, yes. I, my wife just said that 500 bucks we could go to a two-day Sandestin beach trip or we could, uh, the tickets that we still have for the national we'd see on Sunday. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm just, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I would, between you and me, I'd probably prefer seeing the national and being right. able to sleep in and 
I'm not going to sleep in because I don't sleep in. I get before 35 every morning. But I could get up in the morning and relax instead of drive to the beach. Hey, I'm just, you know, saying. All right, all right. I'm, I'm trying to help you work through mm-hmm. this before the show's over, by mm-hmm. the way. But I guess the show is over, so you're on your own after this. Um, hey, thanks for being here. Let's go. We'll, we'll uh, do it again. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk to you uh, next time. And um, continue watching. And thanks, guys. And I'll see you next time.